A piece of whale rib has recently been found in a North Carolina mine. Not a big deal, some might think. Hey, why can't a whale be a miner, right? But this fragment offers scientists a unique glimpse at the interactions between prehistoric sharks and whales from around 3 to 4 million years ago. The thing is, three tooth marks embellish the rib. That means that the whale was once badly bitten by an animal with a super powerful jaw. Judging by the spacing between the tooth marks, and it reaches almost two and a half inches, this animal could be a mega toothed shark. I'm talking about the megalodon. Or it could be a different shark species, which was around at that time. The curvature of the shark's jaw shows that the animal was relatively small, between 13 and 20 feet long. Yeah, small. As for the whale, it seems to be the ancestor of a great blue or humpback whale. Researchers are amazed. You don't usually expect to find evidence of animal interaction and behavior preserved in the fossil record. After examining the sample carefully, they concluded that the shark must have gone away with a mouthful. But the whale had survived because most of the fossil fragment is covered with what is known as woven bone. It quickly forms in response to localized infection. Such bone isn't particularly strong, and later, the body remodels it into compact bone tissue. But it takes time. The presence of this bone means that the healing was incomplete and the whale passed away two to six weeks after the unfortunate encounter. On the other hand, its demise could have been unrelated to the infection and injury. Only a handful of fossils show such kinds of interactions between ancient animals. You can often find bite marks on fossils indicating where the animal passed away and its carcass was scavenged. But this fossil is one of a few examples that not only show a wound inflicted by another animal, but also demonstrate that the prey survived. All fossils are exciting for paleontologists. Yes, they need to get out more. But some might look terrifying to regular people. For example, look at this picture of tentacle arms and octagonal-shaped heads. When it first appeared in mass media, internet users claimed that it was some ancient organism that had come from space. Others thought the story was fake. But in fact, both the picture and the fossil are real. The fossil is known as a mortality plate, a fossilized representation of a mass extinction event of one or several species. The fossil actually contains more than a dozen specimens of a type of marine organism called a crinoid. Despite their looks, crinoids were not plants but marine animals. This particular species lived deep underwater on the seafloor. Crinoids were related to starfish, sea urchins, and brittle stars. These creatures could attach themselves to the seafloor with stalks made up of flexible porous discs connected by soft tissue. The stalks were hollow, and that's where the animal's nervous system was located. Crinoids absorbed oxygen through thin-walled tube feet. The creatures usually reached the length of more than 8 inches and had five arms lined with leathery-looking tentacle-like structures. They fed on plankton and sloughed off organic material. Now, even though these fossil finds seem to be super exciting, few creatures in the fossil record confuse scientists as much as the Tully monster. This curious sea creature sported a toothy, trunk-like snout and eyes splayed out on a rigid rod. But the most bizarre thing? It has been impossible to classify. Researchers have been considering a variety of organisms, for example, segmented worms, swimming slugs, and primitive eel-like creatures, since the monster was discovered in 1966. Recently, they have even tried to connect it to some species of jawless fish with a backbone-like structure. A team of scientists from Japan has used high-resolution laser scanners to examine the anatomy of Tully monster fossils in 3D. They concluded that the enigmatic fossil might be an invertebrate after all. And still, the true identity of the creature remains elusive. In the 1950s, amateur fossil hunter Francis Tully found a ghostly imprint of a torpedo-shaped organism with a huge tail fin in the Mazan Creek fossil beds in Illinois. Tully had never seen anything similar to the torpedo structure. He took his find to Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History. Paleontologists working there were baffled as well. Since then, scientists haven't been able to determine where the creature fits on the phylogenic family tree, or where they should spend Thanksgiving. In 1741, an explorer and captain named Vitus Johansson Berry led an expedition to map the coast of Alaska. The ship he was on got shipwrecked on what later became known as Bering Island. And they got hungry. 
Half the crew survived thanks to the discovery of an extremely large sea cow. With the meat of these animals nourishing them, the sailors managed to build a small ship from the wreckage and return home. On their way back, a scientist who was among them spent his time documenting the animals and plants they had found. The sea cow was particularly interesting because without it, the crew wouldn't have survived. These animals were more than 26 feet long and weighed around 10 tons. All sea cows are members of the order Sirenia, marine mammals more closely related to elephants than cows. The scientists described them as having black skin, a small head, and stubby forelimbs. Those sea cows floated on the water surface, munching on kelp. After the information about these animals became widespread, sea otter fur trading expeditions made use of that convenient depot and route. Sea cows were docile and could be easily hunted. Long story short, within 27 years after the scientists mentioned those animals, they were driven to extinction. But it's not the saddest part. The fossil record reveals a much deeper and darker history. Fossils of sea cows have been discovered all over the world, from Japan to Mexico. It means that the animal once thrived in the vast kelp beds around the entire North Pacific Rim. That small population discovered by the expedition was probably the last remains of a once much larger and way healthier population. More likely, aboriginal hunting had already reduced the numbers of these animals to near extinction levels, and the final blow came from western hunters. The living close relatives of those ancient sea cows are rarely hunted today. Still, they're under threat of extinction themselves. To some, this amazing fossil might look a bit disturbing. Slaves' lentils are fossils that belong to animals called nummulites. They lived and thrived in a warm, shallow sea covering part of Egypt around 40 million years ago. The name nummulites hints at the fact that larger specimens resemble coins. And in Egyptian folklore, they're even referred to as angel's money. These creatures have a simple, single-celled structure, which contrasts with their super-intricate skeleton. Look at this series of spiral overlapping worlds. Each whorl is divided into countless tiny chambers. Nummulites can grow to be 4 inches in diameter, and still, they are the fossils of single-celled animals related to amoeba. How and why did they grow to be so large? The reason could be their symbiotic relationships with other smaller organisms. In the case of modern species, such symbionts are tiny golden-brown single-celled algae called diatoms. The shells of pneumolites are relatively transparent, and since they're flat, there's a large surface area for the light needed for the diatoms to photosynthesize. For some reasons, scientists are still debating about them. The presence of plant symbionts in animals dwelling in the sea encourages the growth of a calcareous skeleton in hosts. So the gigantic size of the pneumolites in Egypt could be due to their close relationship with symbiotic diatoms. Does that make sense? Fun fact! A species of pneumolites evolve very fast, and their fossils change from one layer of sediments to the next. So the limestone used for the pyramids of Giza are so packed with such fossils that it's known as pneumolytic limestone. This limestone also contains two kinds of pneumolites, the smaller slaves' lentils and the larger angels' money. But those are not different species, but rather different stages in the life cycle of a single species. Summers in the Middle East get so hot that they change the landscape dramatically and make entire cities resurface from the past. That's what happened in 2018 when the city built by a mysterious empire on the Tigris River was finally released from its water trap. Archaeologists rushed to the location as they didn't want to miss a rare chance to excavate the site and learn more about the history of the place. They believe they've found the Bronze Age city Zakiku. Founded over 3,000 years ago and fully submerged in the 1980s when a dam was built in its place. It used to be a busy hub for the Mitanni Empire for caravans on the popular trade route. It had water, which is a rarity in the area, and it was a guarantee for success. We know very little about the once powerful empire, as scientists haven't found any written chronicles in the excavated sites. That's why the archaeologists were thrilled to find an entire palace for the local ruler. Several years later, when the area became free from the water again, they found some fortifications to protect the city from foes. The highlight of their expedition was finding a huge public storehouse for trade goods and harvests. Piles of wheat and barley, 
and imported metal and wood. Bread was the staple food for the locals, and they also loved big pots of vegetable soups and stews for lunch. Each household kept sheep, goats, cows, and pigs, so they had a steady source of milk and meat for special occasions. All the constructions found so far were built from bricks molded from mud. The walls that were underwater for over 40 years are so well-preserved as if they went down yesterday. The royal palace stands out as it's larger than the other constructions, has thicker walls, and even pavements made of baked mud bricks that were sealed to be waterproof. The local king must have been in good relations with the emperor of the larger empire, of which Akiku was dependent. Traders who lived in the city collected wooden beams and took them to storehouses. The beams arrived down the Tigris River from the forests in the mountains in the north and east of Mesopotamia. Merchants came here to sell their goods, and then crossed the Tigris on their way to the borderlands. Zakiku was thriving as a center of commerce for about six centuries, until it was hit by a massive earthquake in 1350. Archaeologists found five ceramic vessels holding over 100 clay tablets made close after the earthquake. It's almost a miracle that small tablets of unfired clay managed to survive underwater for decades. People who created those must have carved notes on clay while it was still wet. They wrote about anything, from newly stored harvests to notes for other kingdoms. Then they would let the message dry in the sun. Scribes even had to learn a different language so that everyone outside the city could read it. Scientists believe the tablets they found used to be part of a private archive. They hope to decipher the notes to learn more about the history of Zakiku and the whole empire after the terrible earthquake. The damage to the buildings was so enormous that it was impossible to restore Zakiku to its former glory, and if there had been any survivors, they must have left the city. Several decades later, the Assyrians, who also lived in Mesopotamia, settled here. They built their houses on the ruins of the abandoned city and used whatever structures they could find from the previous residents as outer walls. But they stayed here only for 50 years, then decided to build a new capital on more fertile soil to make some good cash from agriculture. Archaeologists working in Zakiku had to halt excavations when the water levels went back up and covered the city. They sealed the ruins in tight-fitting plastic sheets and put stones and gravel on top. They hope it will help protect the priceless site from water erosion and prevent it from disappearing again. They realize how important water from the dam is for the region, but if it recedes again, they say they'll definitely continue the excavations. There was a bustling community in today's Talamakan Desert in China around 1,600 years ago. It lived along the Naya River, which ran through the desert for miles and got its water from the melting snow in the mountains. After three years of work in the area, archaeologists and scientists managed to dig up eight tombs in the desert. Thanks to the desert heat, the clothes and artifacts inside them were almost as good as new. The people who wore those must have lived in the ancient city of Naya. Naya used to be part of a prosperous kingdom at the heart of the Silk Road trading route and had a population of over 3,000 people. Then, desert sands went rogue and swallowed the city whole. Archaeologists only found the ruins of Nija in the early 20th century. Scientists from different countries have tried to solve its mysteries. It looks like the tombs discovered at the end of the 20th century belong to the wealthy. There were some expensive items inside, a quiver and bow, metal arrowheads, gold earrings, and a glass bead necklace, a lacquer box with a comb, makeup, and a sewing kit in one of the tombs. There was also some silk of top quality, and even the bright colors like green and yellow haven't faded on it. The fabric also had Chinese characters, with quotes from historical books, which helped scientists identify the period in which it was made. Archaeologists later found a large dwelling site and the clearing of three ruined buildings. It will probably take many more years to understand why the city had fallen and what happened to its people. Saudi and French archaeologists teamed up near Riyadh, the Saudi Arabian capital, and stumbled upon an ancient settlement dating back 8,000 years. The scientists used all sorts of cool tech, like laser scanning, drones, and aerial photography, to unearth this Neolithic-era gem. They found the settlement in a local archaeological hotspot. 
Among the treasures they uncovered were a stone temple, remnants of an altar, and over 2,000 graves. All these finds tell us about ancient practices and rituals. The team also found the foundations of four massive buildings, corner towers, and open-air courtyards, all with underground reservoirs to store water for agricultural use. There was also a smart irrigation system with canals and cisterns, which let the city thrive in one of the driest deserts in the world. Rock drawings etched into the nearby mountain depicted the daily life of the locals. The excavations have been going on in the area for over 40 years, and scientists still keep finding new artifacts to answer more of their questions. Fishers have stumbled upon ancient bones, tools, and artifacts that are 9,000 years old on the North Sea floor. British and Dutch archaeologists and paleontologists rushed to see the finds as they were hoping it could be evidence of the submerged Doggerland. And they weren't disappointed. There were even perfect sets of footprints left by Mesolithic people who lived here. 12,000 years ago, during the last major ice age, the British Isles weren't islands at all. There was a landmass made of many hills, marshlands, and dense forests that connected them to the European continent. That landmass was Doggerland, where a prehistoric hunter-gatherer society lived and thrived. But then, the sea level started going up at the speed of 3 to 6 feet a century as glaciers were slowly but surely melting. The locals had to move to areas that today belong to England and the Netherlands. Experts decided to learn more about the history of Doggerland, using data from oil companies working in the North Sea. So far, they've created digital models of what the area of 18,000 square miles might have looked like before it vanished beneath the waves. They still need to analyze samples of ancient insects and plants and the DNA of animals to get a full picture. In the Mexican mountains, there is this ancient species of corn that's twice as big as your average cob and has some crazy aerial roots. These roots drip a slime that could change the game for agriculture and finally put an end to all those toxic chemicals. The locals have been growing this mysterious maize for over 2,000 years, passing down the tradition from generation to generation. A scientist in Oaxaca heard about this supersized corn and decided to check it out. When he finally saw it, he couldn't believe his eyes. This crop was like something out of a myth, towering at 16 to 18 feet tall, with weird fingers sticking out from its stalks. And get this, those fingers were dripping with a thick, gooey slime that acted like a self-fertilizer. No more adding artificial fertilizers to the soil. It's a big deal because most cereal grains can't fix their own nitrogen levels. So farmers have to douse them in nitrogen-rich fertilizers. Not only is this bad for the environment, but it's also expensive. But with this new corn slime, we might be able to solve a systemic problem in our food sources. It's like a biological hack that could revolutionize agriculture as we know it. The locals call this super plant Oloton corn. By the way, it was basically a secret to the rest of Mexico until the 80s. It took another 30 years for a team of researchers to study this super cool maze. They knew they needed the community's help, so they built a lab right where the locals could pitch in. The corn secretes a slime that has bacteria that can convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form the plant can absorb. It means it can draw 80% of its nitrogen from the air. Basically, the holy grail of agriculture. But of course, some people had to ruin the fun by arguing over who owns the rights to this magical corn. It's called biopiracy, and it's not cool. The indigenous people who have been taking care of this crop for centuries are saying, hey, this isn't just a crop, it's part of our culture and heritage. Unfortunately, the Olaton corn isn't being used yet because it can't keep up with modern industrial standards. But scientists are working on cross-breeding it with other varieties to see if they can get the best of both worlds. They've already cut growing time in half and increased nitrogen absorption to 40%, but they estimate it'll take a few more generations to stabilize a hybrid corn. Imagine if we could use atmospheric nitrogen for other cereal grains, like rice or wheat. 
that would be huge for reducing artificial fertilizers that harm our environment. It's crazy to think that a little-known maze from a misty mountain in Mexico could potentially solve world hunger. It just goes to show that diversity is essential to our survival. Speaking of plants that can help us survive in the future, did you know that Mars might be the perfect place for leafy green vegetables to grow? The soil there is packed with iron, which means our favorite greens could thrive. And with Earth's future looking a little uncertain, it's not a bad idea to start thinking about other planets we could live on. Unfortunately, most planets are too hot to sustain life. Seriously, Venus can get up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than metal melts. But Mars is different. Even though it's a cold desert now, billions of years ago, it was covered in water and maybe even life. Scientists are already studying which plants could grow on Martian soil. And it turns out that lettuce, onions, kale, peas, garlic, and even dandelions, yep, those weeds in your backyard, could all potentially survive there. Spinach is another great option, thanks to all that iron in the soil. Who knows, maybe one day we'll all be snacking on Martian microgreens in case Olaton corn can't cover all our needs. One more super plant that can help us in the future is bamboo. And while other countries like China, Japan, the Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia are all about chowing down on those delicious bamboo shoots, they're also a local fave here in the islands. In Bangladesh, they even have a traditional dish that's made with bamboo. No wonder they call it the king of vegetables. It's delicious and packed with health benefits. Plus, just half a cup has 11% of your daily potassium needs. If you're lucky enough to find fresh bamboo shoots, look for ones that are firm and heavy with a wide base. And don't let them turn green. That means they've been out in the sun too long and will taste bitter. If you're feeling adventurous, you can even harvest your own shoots, let's say in Hawaii. But bamboo is not only about food. It boasts a lot of cool things. It's the fastest growing plant on Earth. Some types of bamboo can grow over a few feet in just one day. More than an inch every hour, people. Bamboo is also totally sustainable and renewable because it spreads like wildfire. A bamboo forest grows way faster than a tree forest, so it's basically the superhero of the plant kingdom. Now, some folks say that bamboo can produce up to 35% more oxygen than a bunch of trees put together. Oh, and get this! Bamboo can replace wood in almost anything you can think of. Seriously, there are thousands of bamboo products out there that are just as good as their wooden counterparts. We're talking paper and pulp products, flooring, musical instruments, furniture, construction materials, you name it, bamboo's got it covered. On to some serious stuff. According to British researchers, we're barely scratching the surface of what plants can do for us. First up, we've got super plants. Did you know that the veggies on your plate were once just regular old crops? But out in the wild, there are some seriously tough plants that have developed resistance to all sorts of pests and diseases. Plant breeders are working to crossbreed these wild crops with our domesticated ones, making them just as resilient while still giving us all the benefits we love. It's a global effort, with countries like Brazil, China, and India leading the charge. And with the world population set to hit over 9 billion, these super plants could be a total lifesaver. Next on the list, medicinal plants. We've known for ages that plants can heal us, but are we really making the most of it? There are over 28,000 plant species that have medicinal uses, but less than 16% of them are actually being used in medicine. That's crazy. The industry is worth billions. And countries like Germany are already embracing herbal remedies. But we need to be careful. There are plenty of dodgy products out there that could do more harm than good. Then we have bananas on steroids. Okay, not really. But did you know that we could actually make bananas bigger and better? By tweaking their genes. Don't worry, it's all safe and above board. Scientists can create bananas that are resistant to disease and pests and can even grow in harsher climates. 
That means more food for everyone. Last but not least, it turns out that the flammability of plants is super important when it comes to preventing wildfires and all the damage they can cause. But don't worry, fire is actually a natural process in some ecosystems. The scientists are on a mission to identify plant families that can withstand fires and create landscapes that are more resilient. These plants could even be used as natural fire breaks, saving valuable resources. Now meet cinchona. Not your typical food plant, but it's got some serious game. This tree bark is the secret ingredient to making quinine, which is used to cure malaria. And get this, it was actually the Quechua people of Peru who schooled the newcomers on how to use it. There are some wild stories about cinchona out there. Like, have you heard about the sick lions chewing on the bark? Or the febrile lion that drank from a pond with cinchona bark and was instantly cured? But let's be real, these legends are probably just people trying to make an already cool story even cooler. Anyway, cinchona is a hero, but not all the heroes wear capes. Guess what? A treasure that was thought to be lost forever has been found. Back in April 2015, Deep Ocean Search, a team of treasure hunters, recovered 50 million pounds worth of silver rupee coins from the British steamship. The ship sank in the 40s during its journey from India to England. The wreck was found at a whopping depth of almost 17,000 feet, setting a world record for the deepest recovery ever. To put that into perspective, the famous Titanic wreck is only found at a depth of 12,500 feet. But don't be duped, this was no easy feat. The team faced multiple breakdowns of their systems due to the pressure, temperature, and repeated dives at such a depth. Did you hear about the epic treasure found on the Black Swan Wreck? It was discovered by Odyssey Marine Exploration in 2007 off Gibraltar, and they hit the jackpot. The salvage team found a whopping 17 tons of coins worth $500 million. Can you even imagine that much money? It's said to be the biggest haul ever found in the treasure hunting world. But the crew didn't spill the beans on where they found it or what kind of coins they uncovered. They just hightailed it back to the US with their loot. Sneaky. An old man in the Dominican Republic was selling a coin that ended up being the oldest coin ever minted in the New World. And that's just the start of the craziest shipwreck story ever. The team at Deep Blue Marine used some fancy sonar to search the area where the coin was found, and they stumbled upon parts of a wrecked ship. They also found jade statues, ancient Mayan bling, and gold coins from way back in 1535. Like, one set of four coins alone is worth a cool one million dollars. The crew got to keep half of their booty while the Dominican Republic authorities snagged the rest. It's believed the ship sank during a gnarly hurricane just a few years after Columbus discovered the New World. No other shipwreck has ever turned up such ancient artifacts. We all heard about the Titanic, the OG shipwreck, known for its epic tragedy when it hit an iceberg in 1912. But what's even crazier is that $300 million worth of diamonds went down with it. Like, can you imagine? American and French researchers who found the ship auctioned off nearly 6,000 items recovered from the wreck. We're talking diamond bracelets, fancy dishes, and even a postcard a passenger wrote to their parents. Treasures from the Titanic are still popping up for auction. Like, some deck chairs from the first-class promenade deck were auctioned off for 85,000 pounds. They're too delicate to sit on now, but still a crazy piece of history. The Schmitz, a family of treasure hunters, just stumbled upon over $1 million worth of gold artifacts in shallow waters only 30 miles north of West Palm Beach. And get this, one of the coins was even meant for the King of Spain. These treasures were part of the 1715 treasure fleet that sank 300 years ago due to a massive hurricane after leaving Havana, Cuba. Can you believe it was only 15 feet deep in the water? They found 51 gold coins and 40 feet of ornate gold chain. Talk about hitting the jackpot. Brent Brisbane, the owner of 1715 Fleet Queen's Jewels, LLC, said those finds were important not just for their monetary value, 
but their historical importance. But there's more. The ship was recovered over 50 years ago, and divers have only found about $50 million worth of treasure. It's believed that there's still over $400 million worth of treasure hiding below the sea. The ultimate party of exploration just got a little more exciting. We're talking about Vasco da Gama's Esmeralda, the oldest shipwreck from Europe's age of exploration, baby. This bad boy was wrecked in a gnarly storm back in 1503 along the India route from Europe in the Arabian Sea. But wait, it gets better. The wreck was actually found way back in 1998, but it took almost two decades to excavate it. And guess what? They found rare coins, a ship bell, and other cool artifacts that confirmed the identity of the ship. And the treasures are still being uncovered. Just last year in 2017, they discovered a unique navigational tool called an astrolabe at the wreck. How cool is that? A bunch of Indonesian fishermen found a super old ship from the 9th century off Belitung Island in 1998. It proved that trading between China and the Middle East was totally a thing back then thanks to the Maritime Silk Route. The wreck is so cool that it's also known as the Tang Treasure because it's the biggest collection of Chinese Tang Dynasty artifacts ever found in one spot. But there's some serious drama going down over an exhibition of these priceless treasures. It's like a battle between commercial treasure salvage and archaeological preservation of shipwrecks. Who will win? Only time will tell. Meet the Holy Grail of Shipwrecks! It's the Spanish galleon San Jose and it was loaded with silver, gold and emeralds worth billions of dollars today. But get this, it sunk after a battle with British ships off the coast of Cartagena, Colombia, way back in 1708. Crazy, right? But here's the kicker. 300 years later, in 2015, some awesome peeps discovered the wreck on the ocean floor. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution used a cool underwater vehicle to identify the ship by its distinctive cannons, and they're still recovering treasure as we speak. So, if you're feeling lucky, keep your eyes peeled for other hidden treasures that haven't been found yet. The ultimate jackpot, the sunken mother load of the Nuestra Señora de Atoca, was discovered off the coast of Key West, Florida in July 1985. Mel Fisher, the legendary treasure hunter, spent a whopping 16 years searching for it. The Atocha was on a mission to bring back loads of riches to Spain from Havana, Cuba back in 1622, but got caught up in a gnarly hurricane. To celebrate the 30th anniversary of the discovery, there was a sick auction where people could buy pieces of the Atoka's treasure, like gold and emeralds. If you're keen to see more of this epic haul, head to the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum in Key West. The whole shebang is worth around $450 million, no biggie. Hey, have you ever dreamt of finding buried treasure and becoming a millionaire overnight? Well, guess what? It's not just a dream. Meet Forrest Fenn, the man who hid a chest filled with one to $5 million worth of treasure in the Rocky Mountains. And get this, it took 10 years for someone to finally find it. Fenn announced the treasure hunt back in 2010, and over the years, tens of thousands of people set off to look for it. The treasure chest was filled with 265 American gold eagles and double eagles, ancient coins, gold nuggets, and more. But finding it wasn't easy. Fenn used a poem with 24 lines that had hints in it, and it took some serious decoding skills to figure out where the treasure was hidden. Finally, in June 2020, the long-awaited news came. The treasure had been found. The lucky winner was Jack Stueff, a former journalist and medical student. The treasure was hidden under a canopy of stars in the forest in the Rocky Mountains, and it was so well hidden that not all the advertised treasures were found in the chest. But don't let that stop you from trying your luck at finding buried treasure. Who knows? Maybe you'll be the next lucky winner. And if you need some inspiration, just remember that Forrest Fenn's only goal was to give people some hope. So why not give it a shot and see what you can find? Who knows, maybe you'll become a millionaire too. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. 
This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades, and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Thot. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, 
But Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. So, what comes to your mind when you hear the words green monster? The Hulk? Shrek? Eh, probably. But definitely not a young supernova in the Milky Way galaxy. Oh, and if you have forgotten what our home galaxy looks like, here, have a look. So anyway, is that supernova indeed green and, you know, scary? Not really. But let's start from the very beginning. Cassiopeia A, aka Cass A, is the remnants of a stellar explosion astronomers spotted in the sky 340 years ago. This supernova is 11,000 light years away from us in the constellation Cassiopeia, and its remains span about 10 light years. Recently, scientists have managed to capture the sharpest image of these leftovers yet, all thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope the largest optical telescope in space. The image is full of bright colors, brilliant green, orange, and pink. Maybe if you printed it out, it would make a great painting for your living room. Just like this canvas. Each hue represents a different wavelength of infrared light, which is normally invisible to the human eye. The image can help astronomers figure out what happened to the poor star before its demise. Cass A is the youngest known remnant of a massive star that once exploded in our galaxy. On its exterior, at the top and left, 
you can see curtains of material that seem red and orange because of the emission of warm dust. That's where the ejected material from the exploded star collides with the surrounding gas and dust. Inside this outer shell, there are chunks of bright pink bubble-shaped material that form clumps and knots. It comes from the star itself. This material is shining because of the mix of heavy elements, like neon, argon, and oxygen. Astronomers have spotted some dust emissions in that region too, but they haven't located the sources of these emissions yet. There's also a prominent green loop extending across the right side of the supernova's central cavity. And if you look closely, you'll notice that a big region of Cas A is pockmarked with something that looks like small bubbles, which makes the thing even more complex and hard to understand. The first X-rays from Cas A appeared in the 60s, but light from the supernova probably reached Earth in the 1600s. Unfortunately, there are no confirmed written observations of the supernova from those times. It must have looked like an extremely bright star, and historians still doubt whether any observers noticed it. Oh, and I bet you've been wondering about the nickname, right? This space phenomenon was called the Green Monster in honor of Fenway Park in Boston. Its large green left-field wall has the same name. One of the main questions Cas A might help us answer is, where does all that cosmic dust come from? Astronomers have discovered that even very young galaxies at the early stages of their lives are filled with massive amounts of dust. So, does the universe need vacuum cleaning, or is the problem more complicated? One of the crucial components in the appearance of this dust seems to be supernova. They spew truly terrifying amounts of heavy elements, which are basically building blocks of dust across the cosmos. So let's try to figure out what these supernovae are and how they occur. Good old stars keep their spherical shape because their gigantic mass creates a powerful gravitational field that pulls gas toward the center, and at the same time, their cores produce enough energy to prevent gas from gathering too close to the center. All this creates a nice balance and a beautiful ball-like shape. But once a star becomes too old and massive, about four to eight times as big as our sun, it doesn't have any more fuel left. That's why all the reactions in its core stop. The star's outer layers instantly try to collapse inward, but they bounce off the core, which remains incredibly dense. That's when everything but the star's core blasts out all over the universe in a bright supernova explosion. Now, as you may know, our solar system itself can be a pretty scorching place. For example, the temperature of Earth's core almost reaches a whopping 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about as hot as the temperature on the surface of the Sun. As for the Sun's super-hot center, it's heated up to 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's hot. But if we talk about the universe, such temperatures are nowhere near hot in comparison with a supernova. As you now know, it's the very last stage of a star's life which ends in a gigantic explosion. This explosion is one of the largest in space, and it unleashes enormous amounts of energy. Therefore, the temperature at the core of a supernova is an incredible 6,000 times higher than that of the Sun's core, and it means it can reach several billion degrees Fahrenheit within microseconds, which is almost impossible to imagine. After that, atoms get crammed together so infinitely closely that the squeezed core recoils and a star explodes, creating a superheated shockwave. Anyway, let's get back to our Cas A. By studying it with the help of the James Webb Telescope, astronomers hope to get a better understanding of its dust content. This, in turn, will help them figure out where the building blocks of stars, planets, satellites, and us humans come from. Experts can locate regions with different gas composition and look at the types of dust that form there. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in space too, but don't have your access to the James Webb Telescope, you can get yourself a telescope of your own and enjoy amazing views. Supernovae, as the one which created Cas A, are very important for life as we know it. They spread such elements as, for example, calcium that we have in our bones. 
or iron our blood contains, literally seeding new stars and planets. You, my friend, are made from star stuff. Supernovae don't always mean the end of stars. Even though a star loses its outer layer, it might still survive the explosion. Then it either becomes a black hole or a new kind of star. See for yourself. Even without the outer layers, a star's core keeps collapsing. At one moment, the pressure inside becomes so high that electrons and protons virtually melt into each other and form neutrons. The result of this crazy fusion is a neutron star, whose mass consists of 90% of neutrons. It means that the thing just can't get squashed any tighter. Then, energy starts to leave the fading star, transforming it into a neutron star. And the amount of this energy is so great that it can be compared with the combined light emitted by all the stars in the observable universe. Energy is leaving the star in the form of neutrinos, subatomic particles that are similar to electrons but with no electric charge and a very small mass. And during a supernova explosion, the star emits almost 10 times more neutrinos than the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons in the Sun. No wonder that in such conditions, something truly scary gets born. A neutron star, which is basically a monster nucleus, the central part of an atom, is relatively small. Even though scientists don't know for sure how big neutron stars are, they suppose that these space bodies shouldn't be bigger than 12 miles across. For comparison, our Sun is almost 865,000 miles across which is 109 Earths put side to side. But even with such a modest size, any neutron star will be at least one and a half times heavier than the Sun. Think about this. If you scoop just a teaspoon of neutron star inside, this stuff would weigh no less than a billion tons. That's very dense. So dense that the next stop is the black hole itself. Well, what can I say? Space is an endless source of mystery and inspiration for me. I'm even considering adding some space vibes to my home, and I know just the thing to do it. Hey, don't thank me. Hey there, curious history buffs. Have you heard the legend of the ancient race of giants of Nevada? Yes, I'm talking about actual giants that allegedly lived thousands of years ago. Now I know what you're thinking. Giants, really? Well, archaeological finds add fuel to this debate, too. And here's where it gets interesting. Lovelock Cave was indeed used as a burial site, and some of the remains found there are much larger than average human bones. The cave is by the Humboldt Sink in western Nevada. It was once part of an enormous lake, which eventually dried up, leaving a number of smaller ones, including the Humboldt Sink. The cave became the home of the Cite Ka tribe. According to the legend, these red-haired giants were so big that they had to be buried in the cave itself. Indeed, later on, archaeologists discovered 8 to 10 foot tall skeletons. This legend started to unfold when a mining engineer named John T. Reed talked to the locals in 1886. Once Reed saw the cave, he knew he was onto something. The news spread soon, but the cave was attracting another type of attention too. The deposits of a fertilizer known as guano were discovered inside the cave. So a mining company began excavating the precious resource in 1911 and soon shipped more than 250 tons of the fertilizer to San Francisco. Unfortunately, some of the human remains and artifacts were neglected and lost in the mining process. This led to an official excavation in 1912 and 1924. After the top layer of guano had been mined, strange objects started to surface. Around the area, the earliest evidence of human habitation dates back about 4,000 years. The Lovelock culture lasted for some 3,000 years, and they left us with 10,000 stunning artifacts. The pits in the cave were like a series of time capsules hidden at different depths. Archaeologists determined the age of each pit by its depth. It turns out that many different groups used the cave for storage over a really long time, and the things they stored there give us a really cool glimpse into their cultures. It's like a giant ancient storage unit full of hidden treasures. 
What have the researchers found besides the giant bones, you might ask? Some other bodies were mummified using a method similar to the one applied by ancient Egyptians. These remains also had something in common with the bodies discovered as far south as Lake Titicaca. Both mummies had some red hair. Yet, there are scientists who believe this reddish hue is the result of the interaction with the environment in which the bodies stayed. So, while the story of the red-haired giants may be a wild and intriguing tale, not everyone is convinced. Some experts believe that the bones found in Lovelock Cave are simply the remains of prehistoric animals, like mammoths or sloths. But others insist that there's something more to the story. Other relics, such as finely crafted baskets and exquisite duck decoys made from tule fibers, were also found there. In any case, this cave is worth the attention it gets. By the way, you can still visit this cave today and see the pits of different depths with your own eyes. But let me tell you one thing, it's in a hot, dry, and isolated place. Archaeologists have made another discovery that seems to be straight out of a legend. They think they've found the palace of the one and only Odysseus, who was the legendary Greek king of Ithaca and the hero of Homer's epic poem. Move over, Indiana Jones. We've got some real-life adventure happening here from around 1300 BCE. Apparently, this is the only palace mentioned in Homer's epic poems that hasn't been found. The excavations have been made on the Ionian Islands, and the view from the ruins found on the island of Ithaca are exactly as described in the Odyssey, says the professor who led the excavation team. Known to the ancient Romans as Ulysses, the Greek hero took 10 years to return home to Ithaca after the fall of Troy. For many years, Homer's other epic, called the Iliad, which tells the story of the protracted siege of Troy by the Greeks, was regarded as a myth, too. But then, in the 1870s, Troy was rediscovered in modern-day Turkey's Chanakale city. So, if they found Troy, who's to say they couldn't find Odysseus's home? The researchers were following Homer's words as a roadmap. The excavation site has a building complex with two levels. It has important finds, such as storerooms and workshops, a complicated drainage system, and fragments of pottery. It also has a well from the 8th century BCE, which is around the time when Odysseus is believed to have been the king. Yet, not everyone is convinced that the team has actually discovered the home of Odysseus. A British researcher named Robert Biddlestone insists that Homer's description of ancient Ithaca isn't very similar to the island that now has its name, and that Odysseus's kingdom was actually on the Isle of Cephalonia. However, Italian archaeologist Adriano La Regina might have a more realistic approach to this debate. He says that whether this find has a connection to Ulysses or not, what's more important is the discovery of this royal palace. Once upon a time, in a land far away, the Klamath Indians spread a legend about the creation of Crater Lake. Okay, okay, maybe this land is not that far away and it still exists. You can find it in South Central Oregon, in the Western United States. Anyway, the legend has it that this lake was formed in a vicious battle between two volcanoes, Mount Mazama and Mount Shasta. Then the spirits of Earth and the sky, which are Lao, who ruled the below world, and Skell, the chief of the above world, joined the fight. It turned into a geological drama. During the battle, darkness veiled the land. The fight was over when Mount Mazama collapsed and sent Lao back into the underworld. Then the rain filled the pit and created a lake in the place where the mountain had once stood. Flash forward to our time. Scientists have discovered that Mount Mazama did erupt 7,700 years ago. Artifacts found in the area prove that the legend indeed contains some details about the explosion. The tale says that red-hot rocks were flying through the sky. This happened during the volcanic eruption that caused the mountain to collapse. This created the volcanic caldera, which later on got filled with water. What makes this legend came true story unusual is how long it has existed. 
According to researchers, these types of verbal stories lose their credibility within 600 to 700 years. That's why the legend about the creation of Crater Lake is so unique. So many generations, for hundreds of years, have been accurately passing down the information. This volcanic Crater Lake is now in a national park. It's famous for its deep blue color. The water in it is extremely clear. If you visit it today, the water you'll see won't be the same as for someone who will visit the place 250 years later. Because there are no rivers flowing into or out of the lake, the existing water evaporates and the lake gets filled again by rain and snowfall. Basically, every 250 years, the water is replaced. Plus, this lake is almost 2,000 feet deep, which makes it the deepest lake in the United States. Swimming is okay in the lake, but there's only one legal and safe trail to get to the shore. There are other activities, such as fishing and boat tours. Shared human experiences, such as birth, marriage, and aging, may explain why certain tales are shared globally. Similar struggles and obstacles faced by humans around the world generate similar themes in traditional stories about love, parenting, and mortality. So, do you have legends or tales you've heard of from your grandparents? Who knows? Maybe your ancestors, too, witnessed a cool historical event. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings, except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert. 
to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only opened the doors once a day before people entered the temple, to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes. Get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch-resistant but still covering the entire eye.
And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable, running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. Egyptian archaeologists made an extraordinary discovery near Cairo just recently. Drumroll, please! The most ancient and most complete mummy yet discovered in the country. Yes, they were keeping it under wraps. <laughs> the 4,300-year-old mummy was found in a group of tombs close to the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, dating back to the Egyptian Old Kingdom. It was covered in layers of gold. The team also found several other tombs, including one belonging to an ancient Egyptian official and another belonging to a secret keeper who had the power to perform special ceremonies. Another interesting tomb was that of a writer, which featured the largest statues ever found in the area. This vast burial site is also home to more than a dozen pyramids and resting grounds. Probably one of the most famous mummies in the world is that of Hashisut. She ruled Egypt like a boss for around 20 years, building all sorts of impressive buildings and creating new trade routes. But when archaeologist Howard Carter found her tomb in the Valley of the Kings, her sarcophagus was empty. However, Carter did find two coffins in another tomb, one of which belonged to Hashisut's wet nurse and the other to an unknown woman. In 2006, a team of specialists decided to investigate whether that mysterious lady was the queen herself. They found a molar tooth in a wooden box with Hashisut's name on it, and when they compared it to a gap in the mummy's mouth, it was a perfect match. Ramses II was a pretty impressive ruler but it was his mummy that eventually made history. Now, we don't hear too much about his daddy. Hm. Okay, I'll stop. Ramses is considered to be the most powerful pharaoh in all of Egypt, as he reigned for a whopping six decades. He also lived to be over 90 years old. Now, that's pretty amazing, considering the time he lived in. Ramses II supposedly had over 100 offspring, too. Talk about a big family. When he passed away, his body was originally buried in the Valley of the Kings, but some sneaky guys tried to rob his tomb of all his treasures. Officials back in the day weren't having any of that, though, so they moved his body to a secret location to keep it safe. Fast forward to the 1800s, and Ramses II's mummy was discovered, along with a bunch of other rulers and important officials. But it wasn't in the best condition. So archaeologists flew it to Paris to get it, well, you know, pampered. Problem was, he couldn't just be transported into another country. The only solution available was to give Ramses II his own passport. His occupation was listed as king, and the document even featured his photo. You know, most mummies aren't necessarily known for having the most hydrated skin. But that of an ancient woman, also known as Lady Di, proves otherwise. No, not that Lady Di. This wealthy lady from ancient times was discovered in an ornate tomb in 1971, and she looked fabulous, if we can say so, about a mummy. Thanks to the special conditions in her tomb, like the moisture in the environment and the lack of oxygen, her body was almost perfectly preserved. Her skin was soft, her hair was on point, and she was still flexible. The museum that now proudly displays her mummy also shows a ton of fancy items that were buried with her, like dinnerware and musical instruments. Archaeologists investigated the mummy further and discovered that she passed away from a heart attack at around 50 years old. Even though it hasn't been around for over 2,000 years, Lady Di is still making history. The mummy of Otzi the Iceman was discovered in the Alps in 1991. Austrian authorities initially thought he was a modern mountaineer because he was so well-preserved. Turns out, he was actually from the Copper Age. He was found in a mountain pass over 10,000 feet above sea level. Through studying his mummy, we've learned so much about life in Copper Age Europe. For example, we know that he was a native of Central Europe and enjoyed eating meat. 
He also suffered from arthritis, narrowing arteries, and intestinal problems. But he likely used acupuncture and medicinal herbs to treat these conditions. And apparently, he was pretty handy with tools. He sharpened them just days before his untimely demise. Who knows if he was expecting trouble or just getting ready for some routine work. Now, King Tut and his story is most likely the one that made all mummies famous. This pharaoh passed away at the young age of 19, more than 3,000 years ago. But his mummy is still one of the most well-known in the world. When his tomb was opened in 1922, people went wild because it was still intact, unlike many other royal tombs. It had some seriously blinged-out coffins, including one made of solid gold. Not only did Tut's tomb give us a glimpse into ancient Egyptian history, but his mummy also taught us a lot about the time he lived in. DNA analysis helped identify his parents and revealed that the pharaoh had a rare bone disorder that might have made walking a bit tough. Now, Ginger is most likely one of the coolest mummies you'll ever hear about. He's like a time traveler from 5,000 years ago who's still looking fly with his golden hair and perfectly preserved nails. Ginger was discovered in Egypt and is believed to be the earliest known mummified body. Before people even knew about mummification, they used to place bodies in shallow graves in the hot, dry sand. And since the sand absorbed all the water, bacteria couldn't reproduce and the body was preserved naturally. Now, scientists are not sure if Ginger's preservation was intentional or not. But since he was buried with some pottery vessels, it's likely that whoever buried him knew some serious preservation techniques. If you want to meet Ginger in person, he's currently chilling at the British Museum. One Dutch art collector bought a statue from Asia and ended up finding a weird discovery. The statue contained a mummy hidden inside. Unfortunately, the body was too fragile to move, so they had to leave it there. The coolest part is that this mummy is over a thousand years old and was on display for 200 years before being encased in the statue. When scientists did a CT scan, they found out that the mummy was filled with paper scraps covered in writings. Experts think he might have done this thing called self-mummification, which is a pretty intense process involving a special diet and tea that makes your body less prone to bacteria. Only a few people could handle this ritual, and those who managed to do that were seriously respected. No other Egyptian queen has baffled scientists and historians like the stunning Nefertiti. Based on her statues, she was known for her slender neck, wide eyes, and high cheekbones. Her name translates to the beautiful woman has come. Talk about living up to your name, huh? Even though she wasn't a pharaoh herself, Nefertiti still managed to leave a lasting impression. Written records suggest that, as a wife and queen, she held an incredibly influential role. Because of her power, she was indeed admired, but she also managed to make quite a lot of enemies throughout her life. She was also related to King Tut, but not biologically. Rather, she was his stepmother. So far, locals have yet to identify her mummy, but that may soon change. A local Egyptologist who has been busy excavating tombs in the Valley of the Kings has found two mummies that he believes could be Nefertiti and her daughter. According to specialists, we may soon finally get a definitive answer about the identity of these two mummies. And if one of them does turn out to be Nefertiti, we could be in for a real treat. DNA analysis and CT scans of the mummy could give us the most complete and accurate image of the queen that we've ever seen. It's crazy to think that we've only scratched the surface of what lies beneath modern-day Egypt. Nefertiti ruled during a time of great power and prosperity in Egypt, but unfortunately passed away in a period of social turmoil, leading to her gravesite being lost. Now, where's my mummy? 54,000 years ago, there was one interesting group that lived in caves. A father, daughter, and a couple of other members who were their close relatives. And the cool thing here is that they were the first Neanderthal family we know about. A team of scientists studied ancient DNA from their teeth and bones to learn more about early human society. And this research showed a cool thing. They probably lived in these caves at the same time, together. There were 11 Neanderthals that lived together in one cave and two others from another cave that was somewhere close in the neighborhood. 
So there were 13 of them, eight grown-ups, and five kids. Together with their DNA, scientists also found their stone tools and animal bones. Neanderthals are the ancient human relatives that are definitely the closest ones to us. Their skull was long and flattened if you compare it to the skull of Homo sapiens that's more globular. They also had this specific prominent brow ridge above the eyes. You can easily recognize them by their face too, with the central part of the face protruding forward. Plus, they had a large, broad nose. Some believe their nose was a way of adapting to living in cold, dry environments. When the inside of the nose is bigger, it moistens and warms the air you breathe better. Unlike us, they didn't have much of a chin. Also, scratch marks on their front teeth tell us Neanderthals used them like a third hand when they would prepare food and work with materials they used. Their bodies were strong and muscular with wide shoulders and hips. Their average height was 5 to 5.7 feet with a weight of 140 to 180 pounds. Their stocky appearance with short lower arm and lower leg bones minimized their skin surface, better protecting them from the cold. Their lifespan was about 30 years, even though some of them lived longer than that. Neanderthals would dwell in regions that are now Europe and Asia for over 350,000 years. They disappeared somewhere around 40,000 years ago. That's about the time we could find traces of Homo sapiens in Europe. Their families were close-knit groups of 10 to 20. That's a lot less than the population of any ancient or modern human community. It's more like the size of groups of endangered species that are close to going extinct. These Neanderthals lived in their caves with small communities, but they didn't live isolated from the rest of their kind. They relied on each other for survival. They took care of one another, especially those who couldn't care for themselves. Also, their caves aren't as primitive as we might imagine. For example, they had a hole close to hearths and they would probably use it to heat water. Also, they would organize their space. They had sleeping areas, parts of the cave where they could leave trash, and areas where they could make stone tools and prepare their food. They would travel through the river valleys to catch their prey, such as bison, ibex, horses, and other animals. They were skilled in planning their strategies. Some studies showed they were aware of reindeer migration patterns, so they would plan their actions according to their predictions of where their prey could move. One of the biggest animals they would go after was the woolly mammoth. You know them, a relative of modern elephants covered in fur with a weight of up to 12,000 pounds that went extinct a long time ago. And studies showed woolly mammoths and Neanderthals shared some genetic traits. It's not that surprising when you think about it. Both species developed from African ancestors before they managed to adapt to the cold, harsh climates of Eurasia during the Ice Age. So they faced similar conditions and both went extinct at about the same time. Neanderthals also used stone to make tools, similar to ones other early humans used, such as scrapers and blades made from stone flakes. These tools scientists found in both of the caves they studied are created using the same raw materials. That means the communities probably hung out and interacted with each other in some way. Until the 20th century, many thought that Neanderthals were very different from modern humans considering their genetics, physical appearance, and behavior. But more recent discoveries about this well-preserved Eurasian fossil population have shown that some of the people in it were the same as people alive today. Neanderthals lived before and during the last ice age in some of the harshest places that humans have ever lived. Besides their tools and catching animals, they also gathered plants from around their area. They would also eat cooked vegetables relatively often. Their ability to stay alive for tens of thousands of years during the last ice age is a good example of how humans can adapt to almost any situation. Neanderthals made the earliest cave art that we know about. Scientists explored three Spanish caves where they lived and all of them had black and red paintings of dots, animals, and geometric symbols. Together with handprints, 
hand stencils, and engravings. These paintings were made more than 60,000 years ago. Since Homo sapiens came to Europe 20,000 years after that, we can assume Neanderthals were the only human species on the continent at the time, so they must have been the ones who created this art. Also, these caves were 435 miles apart, so it wasn't like only some of the Neanderthals knew about it. Paintings were obviously their long-lived tradition. They were also big fans of fashion. They made their own jewelry, some of it out of eagle talons. The oldest examples we could find are nearly 130,000 years old. They also most likely used pigment to camouflage or decorate their bodies. Also, Homo sapiens weren't the only species that used fires. Researchers looked at more than 140 fireplace sites across Europe and realized Neanderthals used fire there for a long time too. These signs included charcoal, burned bones, and heated stone artifacts. Neanderthals used fire for cooking food and making tools. They would stick wooden shafts into pieces of stone with pitch, which would be like natural glue. Since burning the bark of birch trees is the only way to make this sticky liquid, the Neanderthals must have been able to control fire. Most people imagine Neanderthals probably grunted, but that's not true in reality. They didn't quite sound like us either. Their big chest, posture, and the shape of their throats probably resulted in a voice that was louder and higher pitched than the average human's voice. They probably didn't have sophisticated vocabularies as we do, but they could use complex speech because they had the hyoid bone. It's this little thing we have in our neck too, the one that supports the root of our tongue. It's the same feature that allows us to vocalize as we do. They were more similar to us than we might expect. Some believe Neanderthals even built boats so they could sail across the Mediterranean. And it's not like Neanderthals lived somewhere, went extinct, and then modern humans showed up. It seems these groups did meet around 100,000 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula or in the Middle East. That's when the first groups of modern humans were moving from Africa. Scientists analyzed the DNA of one of the Neanderthal women that lived more than 50,000 years ago, and it includes genetics from modern humans too. Some traits we have, like skin and hair color, mood and sleeping patterns, are connected to the amount of sunlight we get. Neanderthals lived in Europe and Asia for a long time before modern humans arrived there, so they were used to less sunlight compared to the ones who came from Africa. Neanderthals had different traits because of their exposure to less sunlight, and these traits were passed on to their offspring when they had children with modern humans. In other words, some of the traits that modern humans have today are influenced by Neanderthal genes. For example, People who are night owls often have Neanderthal genes. Also, around 1% of Neanderthals had light skin, red hair, and perhaps even freckles. It all happened in 1708. On June 8th, the Spanish galleon San Jose was going back home to Spain from the Caribbean. In total, there were 17 ships. The captain of the San Jose knew they were in for some trouble as English ships were lurking in that area. He knew they would be after the treasure loaded on the ships. The price of the treasure from the New World was so astronomical that it could turn the course of historic events in Europe upside down. In order to be safe, the Spanish galleon was to reach Cartagena de Indias. It's where we have Colombia now. But sadly, other things were predestined for the San Jose. The four English ships appeared. The galleon couldn't just escape them. There was no choice but to turn around and fight. Then all the chaos started. Red flags showing that the battle started. Firing cannons, the smell of gunpowder. Nobody knows exactly how it all ended. As dusk fell, it was hard to see clearly what was happening. The only thing that remained in history was the sinking flagship San Jose. Then silence. No wonder that San Jose, being the flagship, was the most strategically important galleon. She would carry an insane amount of precious metals, such as gold and silver, 
pearls, and gems such as emeralds. All of that went to stay on the bottom of the ocean for the next three centuries. But how come this lost treasure got so legendary? First off, the financial estimates made by scientists shocked people. The ship reportedly carried 7 million to 12 million pesos. Let's translate that to today's money. Yeah, it may not be the wealth that Elon Musk has, but it's around $10 billion. With that money, you could treat yourself to a couple of private jets, a whole car park of Lamborghinis, and a posh mansion. And you'd still have a lot of money left. You may think it all must have gotten rusty, just like the bits and pieces found in the Titanic. But when it comes to gold, things work differently. The Titanic didn't carry gold, or at least not that much of it. The jewels that were on the Titanic were personal belongings. And the cool thing about gold is that it never reacts with oxygen. It means that real gold won't rust or tarnish. So if your golden necklace got somewhat darker, it's a telltale sign it's not pure gold. It's an alloy, which is also cool, by the way, as you can easily clean it. Going back to San Jose's lost treasure, the golden coins there, even over 300 years later, were supposed to look the same way as the day they were minted. Now, going back to the place where the ship supposedly sank, remember I told you the captain wanted to go to the shore where Colombia is today? Well, on December 4th, 2015, the ship was indeed found in the waters of Colombia. As with many other important things today, the world learned about it from a tweet. It was sent by the Colombian then-president Juan Manuel Santos. People have been looking for the San Jose for decades, and once it was finally found, it only got more popular, and even more myths about it began to appear. One of the legends was told by Senor Santos himself. After the wreck had been found, there was a short radio interview. Thing is, the discovery was pretty unexpected. Many people spent a lot of time and effort looking for that wreck, and many of them even gave up hope of ever finding it. Juan Manuel Santos told a story about how the wreck had been discovered. There was an official event outside Colombia where he was accosted by a man. He looked like the famous writer Hemingway. He sported a white beard and had white hair. The only thing that Hemingway-looking man wanted was two minutes of Santos' time. The president conceded and listened to the man. What happened next was unbelievable. The man pulled out an antique map, more precisely, a carefully framed copy, and told the president that no one else knew about it. The man pointed to one exact spot. He said that it was the exact location of the treasure, and that that place didn't appear on any other map. He guaranteed that he knew where the treasure was. The story sounded crazy and swashbuckling. Whoever that man was, he turned out to be right. His identity remains a mystery for everyone, but somehow that man found the funding, determined the area to be inspected, and even made his way to meet the president. Right, the San Jose was stuffed with gold, and whoever found it would get filthy rich for the rest of their life. But let's face it, there's no way an ordinary person could ever discover such a treasure as it requires too much effort and too much funding. But what if you're into treasure hunting and you want to go and find some treasure chests somewhere? Well, I guess I have a story about ordinary people looking and even eventually finding real treasure. Meet Forrest Fenn, an eccentric millionaire who hid a one to five million dollar treasure. The exact worth was unidentified, you see, even Mr. Fenn himself said he never tried to appraise it. Inside the chest, there were 265 American gold eagles and double eagles, ancient coins, gold nuggets, you name it. Forrest stashed the chest in the Rocky Mountains and announced the treasure hunt back in 2010. Now let's focus on a map for a little bit and see how vast the Rocky Mountains are. Basically, the treasure hunters were supposed to sweep the two countries, both the USA and Canada. At first, it was a small treasure hunt with only a couple of people who knew about it. But sometime later, there was pretty much a competition as tens of thousands of people set off to look for the treasure. 
there was research stating that over the decade, about 350,000 people tried their luck looking for the mystery chest. To announce the hunt, Forrest Fenn used a poem made up of 24 lines. The poem had some hints in it that most treasure hunters failed to decode. It was so well hidden that it took 10 years to finally discover it. There was also a blog called Thrill of the Chase, and on June 6, 2020, Mr. Fenn finally posted the long-awaited news. The treasure had been found. Forrest himself admitted that anyone who read the instructions from the poem carefully could find the treasure. The poem created a lot of buzz on the internet, with many users trying to decode the nine hints the poem had. Some of them even suggested the possible keys to decode the puzzle. Those speculations might have helped the person who eventually found the treasure. At first, even Forrest Fenn himself didn't know who cracked all the codes in the poem, made it through the dense forest, and retrieved the chest. The lucky finder preferred to stay anonymous, and all we initially knew was that it was a man from the eastern United States. The winner sent a photograph to Forrest Fenn, and thus the treasure hunt was officially over. Sometime later, though, he revealed himself. It was Jack Stewart, a former journalist and medical student. The treasure was hidden under a canopy of stars in a forest in the Rocky Mountains. The vegetation there is lush, so the chest was hidden deep within. The chest had never been moved from the place where it was originally hidden. The exact location is still unknown, but we know that the treasure was hidden in Wyoming. Jack admitted that not all the advertised treasures were found in the chest. A small gold frog on a necklace and a Spanish emerald ring were missing. Forrest indeed found the frog in his collection and gave it to Stuif, but he failed to find the ring. The treasure hunt created by Forrest Fenn may seem extravagant, but he explained why he decided to start it. The only thing he claimed to have in mind was to give people some hope. There are many myths around arguably the greatest structure ever built by humans, the Great Wall of China. Some say it's so grand that it's visible from space. Others claim that you can see it from as far as the moon. Other theories suggest that the builders of the wall were left inside. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but all these impressive stories are just myths. But even with those stories busted, the Great Wall of China is an impressive and truly breathtaking structure. So let me tell you its true story. Today, China is one of the most populated countries in the world, counting as many as 1.4 billion residents. It's also one of the oldest nations in the world. It has 3,500 years of continuous written history. But the civilization existed long before that. There is a theory that while the European continent, for example, was most likely reached by humans from Africa, China wasn't populated by settlers that came from somewhere else. Some people believe that the Chinese civilization got formed from local Stone Age people who lived on the territory since the prehistoric period. So now, the Great Wall of China. It's truly big even by today's standard, stretching for over 13,000 miles. To imagine it better, it's almost five times the distance between New York and Los Angeles. Or even a bit greater than the distance between the North and South Poles. Even in modern times, people have never built anything close to this big. Of course, it didn't take a day to build the Great Wall of China. Two, eh, keep going. In fact, the wall was being built for centuries. Maybe you know that ancient cities had walls around them to protect themselves from invaders. Yes, Chinese cities had them too. The first Chinese emperor united the country in 220 BCE and got a brilliant but very ambitious idea to turn all city walls into one big wall that would defend the country's border against attacks from the north. A trusted general directed the construction enrolling a big group of workers, soldiers, commoners, and convicts. Back then, the wall was built of rammed earth and wood. In some places that were strategically important, the sections of the wall overlapped to provide maximum security. The walls were around 26 feet high on average. 
But the Great Wall didn't yet look like the construction we know today. Every next emperor would pick up the Big Wall project, strengthening and extending it, repairing, but also modernizing construction techniques. Some used bricks to build it. Others moved on to granite and marble blocks. Watchtowers and platforms weren't there from the beginning as well. They were added by Ming emperors. The watchtowers made it possible to communicate with other parts of the wall through smoke and fire messages. So the wall is quite inconsistent in terms of material, but it only adds more charm to the construction and shows how much effort and time it took. The reasons why some parts of the wall have been standing for centuries and are still in good condition is glutinous rice flour. Turns out, this sticky rice mortar is almost like cement. It's very strong and waterproof, sealing the bricks so tightly together that even sneaky weeds can't grow between them. You may also notice that some bricks have writings carved on them. They were left by the workers who were building the wall. The purpose of those writings is quality assurance. They contain such information as location, quantity, and responsible officials. So, in the case of some problems with the quality of materials or constructions, it would be known who should be held accountable for it. Recently, a research group has looked through official historical documents of the Ming Dynasty that ruled China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. They came across records of secret doors in the Great Wall. So they decided to find them. They used a flying robot to capture continuous centimeter resolution photos of the wall. They photographed 90% of the wall that was built during the Ming Dynasty and discovered the remains of over 220 secret doors along the wall. Some of them have a specific width and height that allows only one person to go through. Others are large enough to allow two horses to pass at the same time. Why are the doors there? Well, the Great Wall's main goal was to protect the country from the enemy. Building doors that could let the enemy in would undermine the whole point of having a wall. So, of course, the doors were secret passages. They perfectly matched the surroundings topographically. And the exit on the outside was camouflaged with bricks so that it was almost completely indistinguishable from the brick wall. The wall was never just a defensive wall and it was never completely closed. It could be opened on demand. It was also a structure used for trade and commerce, communication between inside and outside the wall, and of course, for defense and spying. Some doors were used for trade with the other side. Through smaller doors, a person would sneak out to spy on the enemy that lived on the other side. The hidden gates were also useful for a sudden attack. As you remember, some gates were camouflaged with brick on the outside. The exit was so indistinguishable that the enemy had no idea exactly where it was located. The inside entrance for Chinese soldiers was hollow, so they could walk through the wall and break the camouflaged exit gate from the inside, starting their surprise attack. Now, Even though the main point was to prevent outsiders from getting into the city, the wall wasn't too effective on that matter. It could still be climbed over or marched around. So the wall was being watched at all times, and the guards gave signals to the troops if they saw the enemy approach. Also, the wall provided more time to mobilize and bulk up the country's forces or lure the enemy troops into a difficult strategic position. The construction stopped at the end of the 19th century. The wall lost its strategic and military importance due to technological advances. Over the centuries to today, only 8% of the Great Wall is in good condition, and the rest is damaged. Also, around one-third of the wall has disappeared without a trace due to both natural erosion and human damage. I guess you could say it's now just a pretty good wall. As you remember, the first parts of the wall were built out of rammed earth and wood. These are not the most unfailing materials if we're talking about thousands of years. Also, destructive farming methods have turned large areas into a desert and contributed to erosion. Also, many bricks were taken away from the wall in the last century to be used in building farms and houses. The wall is being deconstructed stone by stone even today, but this time by tourists. Quite a few of them take a stone as a souvenir. That's a total of a lot of stones. 
considering that over 10 million tourists visit the Great Wall every year. Since 1987, the wall has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site, highlighting that it has an outstanding importance to humanity. The wall is one of China's 56 World Heritage Sites, second place among countries with landmarks protected by UNESCO. Who's first, you ask? Well, the top spot, with 58 World Heritage Sites, belongs to Italy. And do you know that the wall isn't only a famous tourist attraction, but also the location of the Great Wall Marathon? It's a marathon that was established in 1999 and is one of the most challenging ones in the world. You guessed right, people run along the wall, including all the steps. There are three distances, so that participants can run a full marathon that is 26 miles, a half marathon that's 13 miles, or just have a fun run of 5 miles. Do you remember 2011? Well, play along with me. A diver is set to go deep into the waters of the Musi River, located in the heart of an Indonesian island. He is one among many who have been getting unbelievable artifacts from the bottom of the river. Little by little, divers and fishers discover a long-lost Sumatrian civilization. Known as the Island of Gold, the kingdom of Srivijaya was most likely the closest to a real-life El Dorado there has ever been. However, it disappeared late in the 13th century, and until recently, researchers didn't even know the exact location of the kingdom. Picture a civilization built on a river, a true water world, according to the archaeologists that have been studying Srivijaya. Houses, markets, and places of worship were built on wooden piles above the level of the water. Citizens moved around like modern-day Venetians in simple boats. Srivijaya was known to be a rich and important kingdom. It existed from the 7th to the 11th century CE. It was part of the Silk Road, and anyone traveling from east to west had to pass through the city. Their kings were smart and gained control of the Malacca Strait, which allowed the town to have total control over trading routes in the region. If anything, they sure were honoring the town's name. Srivijaya translates from Sanskrit into prosperous victor or simply glorious. The kingdom was an important commercial outpost of ancient times. It was strategically located among the most influential commercial routes of the ancient world, which means its citizens became extremely rich. Ancient wealthy societies used to overly display their gold and precious metals. They would often use these metals as offerings to their deities, or they would use them to forge large statues and to make jewelry for kings and queens and decorations for their palaces. Trivijaya wasn't different. Local Indonesian divers who have been exploring the half-mile of the Musi River near the city of Palembang have found some evidence. So far, they've discovered a life-size statue of Buddha, jewelry studded with precious gems, temple bells, mirrors, golden jugs, and other items. No official archaeological excavations have been done in the area, so these artifacts are the first items of the Srivijayan Empire ever found. Sean Kinsley, a British maritime archaeologist who has reported on these discoveries, says he is truly surprised. For long, people have been speculating about the true wealth of Srivijaya, and it seems that the rumors have been confirmed. We're starting from ground zero, he says. We don't know what clothes the people of Srivijaya wore, what their tastes were, what kinds of ceramics they liked to eat off. Even though this discovery has brought excitement to the scientific community, there is a downside. Divers and fishers sell the retrieved artifacts at the International Antiquities Market before archaeologists can take a look at them. Researchers could try to buy some items, but they're sold for millions of dollars worldwide. Most of the information we know about this El Dorado of the East was learned from merchant accounts of the city. These descriptions say Srivijaya was a kingdom of human-eating snakes and multilingual parrots. That's weird. Some say its active volcanoes gave the town an eerie and enigmatic sight, and all stories emphasize the amount of gold available there. Travel reports were a common way to describe cities in ancient times. In case you didn't know, this is how the legend of El Dorado originally began. As European explorers began their excavations in South American lands back in the 1500s, 
The word got out that an Amazonian civilization used to paint their leader in gold as an offering to higher powers. The legend of El Hombre Dorado, also known as the Golden Man, began to quickly spread around Europe. It turned out that it was only a ceremonial piece of pre-Columbian civilization. It had nothing to do with the land of infinite gold. Now, no one knows what brought about the decline of the Srivijaya Empire. Some speculate that its active volcanoes could have swallowed it. Or maybe wooden houses built above the river eventually sank. Maybe if divers keep retrieving lost items from the bottom of the river, archaeologists will be able to figure out what happened to the city. It seems to be quite common in the history of the world. Some ancient civilizations disappeared without a trace, as happened with the Mayan civilization, for example. The Mayans managed to build one of the biggest empires in pre-Columbian America. It was believed to be home to over 2 million people, and it thrived for over six centuries. Its sudden demise is something that bothers archaeologists and scientists alike. The Mayans began to settle in South America as early as 1500 BCE. Their civilization spanned Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They are believed to have built around 40 cities at the height of their empire. They also developed a complex hieroglyph system that has been studied since it was discovered by modern scientists. The Mayans were keen engineers, astronomers, and farmers. They were post-nomadic people that settled in vast areas of farmland where they could grow corn and other types of vegetables. Archaeologists are still learning a lot about the Mayan civilization by examining their ruins. The city of Chichen Itza, located in the Yucatan Peninsula, is one of the most important Mayan sites on Earth today. The site is made up of a total of 26 ruins, and it is home to a world-famous pyramid known as El Castillo. It consists of a series of square terraces with stairways on each of the four sides of the temple. It was built as an homage to a feathered serpent deity. The Mayans were such architectural geniuses that they managed to build a pyramid that cast a particular shadow. More specifically, in the late afternoon during the spring and fall equinoxes, the pyramid cast several triangular shadows that create the illusion of a feathered serpent crawling down the pyramid. And they created this with none of the tech we have today. The city is so amazing that since 2007, it has been considered one of the seven wonders of the New World. The Mayan Empire thrived for over six centuries due to their wise resource management system and astronomical knowledge. They were able to accurately predict eclipses and, using their rudimentary technology, could even locate Venus and Mars. They had everything to thrive for much longer than they actually did. This is why the Mayans' fall intrigues modern scientists so much. No one has been able to understand completely what led to their demise. That is, until a recent discovery. A study done by NASA claims it can explain what might have happened. Scientists have uncovered a sample of pollen trapped for over 1,200 years in ancient layers of lake sediment, which dates back to the time just before the collapse of the civilization. The analysis has revealed something completely new about the Mayans. Instead of the suspected claims that the Mayans disappeared due to terrible disease or some extended conflict in the region, it could have happened due to deforestation. Perhaps to build their entire empire, they had to cut a lot of trees. Without trees, their soil could have eroded, and all their fertile lands could have slowly and gradually become barren. According to NASA scientists, the temperatures in the region could have risen by about 6 degrees. And from that point on, the land would have become even drier and crops more difficult to grow. Basically, NASA says that the Mayans couldn't do the sole thing that made them thrive, which was agriculture, and their kingdom began to decline. Oh yeah, and this theory was supported by yet another find. Archaeologists found skeletons from the time of the empire. Those had prominent signs of malnutrition. This theory might really shed new light on Mayan history. It could explain what brought down such a powerful civilization. So, what do you say? Which theory is true? Have we actually managed to find out the reason for the fall of the Mayan Empire? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.